This week's Royal Related Moments had new productions, a bit of politics, and of course, polo. Let's take a look at all things Royal Related from the week. Similar to the past several weeks, there is not much to say in terms of engagements from the royals who are considered working royals. Charles was presented with the first banknotes with his picture on them. Multiple outlets reported that William and his mother-in-law, Carol Middleton, were spotted at a pub together, although there were no pictures of the outing. There were, however, photos of William and Prince George out together at a, depending on where you're listening from, soccer or football game on Thursday, making this the first time that William has been photographed in public since Kate's cancer announcement, as he pulled back from work engagements and was absent from Easter services this year. Not only is it interesting that William is able to attend sporting events and celebrity galas, but not work engagements, but we also have to talk about this photo, where not only was an onlooker able to get a clear, close-up photo of the two, but several other people in the room also have their smartphones out to take photos as well, which is the reaction we would expect if members of the royal family were out and about in public which only makes the lack of reaction from the public to Kate's outing at the farmer's market even more strange. Speaking of Kate, with no new stories to write about her, the royal reporters decided to recycle some old favorites, pulling out multiple articles claiming that Harry is pining for his old life, looking for a way to return, and the uncomfortable fantasy they seem to have that Harry is devastated over losing Kate. And I hope the royal reporters understand that since we know most of their stories come in the form of leaks from the palace, all these articles do is make it sound like Kate was secretly hoping Harry would turn into more than just the third wheel. And maybe it's me, but Harry just doesn't seem like he's missing anything. But we'll get to these photos later in the video. Another update this week on the Prince of Wales came from Tom Sykes, a royal correspondent who frequently has scoops from a friend of William and Kate's. According to Tom, William is solidifying his plans to be a work-from-home royal, transitioning to mainly Zoom calls and virtual meetings. And I can't help but wonder what that means for the tabloids' deals with him. Are the royal rota going to get exclusives of him making FaceTime calls in his pajamas from his living room? Certainly doesn't sound like that's the way to hold up his end of the deal with Murdoch. And for someone who's been nicknamed Workshy Willie for decades now, decisions like this one only prove that he got that nickname for a reason. And if true, this poor decision would be one more in a long line of poor decisions that William and his team have made this year. I was watching a TED Talk recently with Sam McAllister, the journalist who secured the disastrous Prince Andrew interview. And in her TED Talk, and most interviews she has done, One thing that she consistently says is how surprised she was that after the interview was finished, no one on the side of the palace seemed to have any concept of how badly Andrew had done. This is the face of the man at the end of that interview. He looks like he's won the lottery. Emily looks like we've shot her dog. (laughs) We had not. And here is the moral of our tale. It's a tale of hubris. It's a tale of misunderstanding. It's a tale of persuasion, of course, but it's a tale of royal delusion. And that is why and how you can convince a prince. Royal delusion. All I could think of was William and how poorly Kensington Palace has handled the last few months of PR for William and Kate. The institution is writing itself and the main players out of relevance all on their own. And all we have to do is sit back and watch. Something I would rather not watch is Samantha Markle continue to drag out her unwinnable case. Despite failing to prove defamation multiple times in court, Samantha and her legal team are appealing the judge's ruling dismissing all of her claims with prejudice. Dismissing the claims with prejudice means that Samantha cannot bring these same claims against Megan again. However, she can appeal the judgment, which is what she's doing here. Typically, with an appeal like this, the party seeking the appeal would claim that there was some error of law that occurred during the case. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier video, I read the entire judgment, and the judge was incredibly thorough and detailed in her explanation of why the claims do not meet the definition of defamation. And while their siblings and half-siblings continue to fixate on Harry and Meghan, Harry and Meghan continue to focus on their work. 
On Monday of this week, an article from Axios detailed the work that Meghan and Harry are doing to safeguard voters from disinformation in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. According to the article, they are working with a bipartisan coalition to prepare voters for an onslaught of AI-generated deepfake videos going into this campaign season. Why does this matter? Last year, the Fifth Circuit Court ruled that the White House, the FBI, and other federal officials likely violated the First Amendment by encouraging social media companies to crack down on COVID-19 misinformation. The Supreme Court is currently hearing an appeal of this ruling, but this case and the ruling have already reduced the contact between government officials and big tech companies, which will affect election information. To combat this, a company called The Future U.S. is using prototype ads to hopefully interest Hollywood writers, executives, and influencers to support their efforts and create a massive media campaign highlighting the issue, specifically in swing states. Harry and Meghan's Archwell Foundation is said to be brainstorming new content for this media campaign, which will launch in late spring. On Wednesday, Harry was in San Francisco at the Better Up Uplift Summit, where he hosted a panel conversation specifically aimed at C-level leaders. The discussion focused on how leaders can manage the stress of their job, build resilience, and still foster a positive culture within their work center. Harry also ran into, as Mindy put it in her Instagram caption, one of his wife's friends at the conference. Mindy Kaling joined Megan on her Archetypes podcast for the episode The Stigma of the Singleton, and I love that their friendship has continued. On Thursday, Harry and Megan made headlines once again when Archwell Productions announced two new projects they are working on. One show will focus on Megan's love of cooking, gardening, entertaining, and friendship, and sounds like the perfect complement to her new lifestyle brand. The show is being produced by Sony Picture Television's The Intellectual Property Corporation, and Megan is listed as one of the executive producers. The second series will follow the world of professional polo, and as we saw from paparazzi photos taken yesterday at the U.S. Polo Open in Wellington, Florida, filming has already begun. Harry and Meghan will serve as executive producers on the show, which is described as pulling back the curtain on the grit and passion of the sport and revealing what it takes to compete at the highest level of polo. And I'm very interested in this series, and not just for the white pants, but really because polo is a sport that requires a lot of athleticism, and that isn't always captured because it's often overshadowed by the aesthetics of the events themselves. And understandably so, because the aesthetics are usually incredible. The moment of the week was undoubtedly Harry and Meghan's attendance at the polo match in Florida. The night before the match, Prince Harry took part in a panel in South Beach with members of the polo community, Centibale, and Lebec to discuss health, wealth and equity, and climate challenges facing youth in Africa. During the panel, Harry discussed why he and Prince Seso founded Centibale and his love of Africa. But Friday was the main event, with Harry and his longtime friend Nacho Figueres captaining teams competing at the Grand Champions Polo Club for the Royal Salute Polo Challenge, ultimately raising $1 million for Centibale. But we can't talk about the polo event without talking about how incredible Harry and Meghan looked. Their look Friday evening had the perfect combination of royalty, class, and honestly, sexiness. Harry captured the polo look perfectly, and Meghan looked stunning in this cream Heidi Merrick dress, adorably named the Ginger, and she paired it with the perfect accessories. But I think it was the combination of the two of them that really captured people's attention. These photos, mostly taken by Thomas Cordy of the Palm Beach Post, are, I think, up there with some of the best photos ever taken of the Sussexes. He captured their chemistry, their presence, and how in sync they are with each other, all in one picture. Every single photo from this event showed Harry and Meghan's love for each other, their love for their friends, and Harry's love of the game. Each photo that came out seemed to be better than the last, and I couldn't help but think how great it is to see them so happy and so loved by their community after everything they've been through. And if this event is any indication of what is to come in the future, the others on that island should really just stop trying to compete. The Sussexes have what the others have long struggled to attain glamour, popularity, a pretty epic love story, and global support. And they have it just by being themselves. People often say what a loss it was for the royal family when Harry and Meghan stepped down as working royals. But I think it's one of the best decisions they ever made. Because yes, it was a loss for the royal family, but it was a huge gain for themselves and the world.